Hi everyone, welcome back. This is part three of black body radiation spectrum. In today's video, we are going to talk about how Max Planck provided a resolution to the ultraviolet catastrophe problem and how he provided an explanation to the experimental observations of black body radiation. But more importantly, in doing so, he would prove that some of our deeply held uh, beliefs about classical physics are wrong and we would have to make new assumptions about how matter and radiation interact and more specifically uh, how radiation is emitted by matter. I'm going to come to these points in detail in this video but first let me mention that I have already made two distinct videos on this particular topic. The very first video on black body radiation was regarding the various experimental observations of black body radiation like Stevens law, Wayne's displacement law, etc. And the second video that I made was regarding the Rayleigh genes law, which was essentially a classical explanation to the black body radiation spectrum and how Rayleigh and genes combined classical electromagnetic theory and classical thermodynamics to come up with an explanation of the black body radiation spectrum Spectrum, but ultimately failed to do so properly which led to the ultraviolet catastrophe. The experimental observations of black body radiation spectrum as opposed to the classical predictions of uh, the black body radiation spectrum using Rayleigh genes predictions. So therefore we are at a very important turning point in physics where it is very very important to provide a proper explanation to this kind of a uh, catastrophe. You see the name itself suggests that it is a catastrophe in physics, ultraviolet catastrophe. Okay, so let's take this uh, step by step. First, what was the explanation and the nature of the explanation provided by Rayleigh genes? Well, what Rayleigh genes did was they assumed that there is some kind of a cubical cavity and inside the cubical cavity, if you heat the cavity, the walls of the cavity would emit radiation and that radiation will form standing wave patterns in between the walls and by calculating the number of standing wave patterns and by multiplying that with the average energy associated with standing waves, Rayleigh genes predicted the energy density associated with the cavity radiation with respect to frequency. So essentially what we are trying to calculate is U T nu D nu. What is this? This is known as the energy density or spectral energy density associated with black body radiation cavity because this is the total amount of spectral energy emitted per unit time per unit volume in a given frequency range for a specific value of frequency and Rayleigh genes obtained this by a very simple calculation. They tried to calculate the total number of standing waves that forms inside a three-dimensional cavity so the number of standing waves associated with some frequency in a given frequency range per unit volume for a cubic cavity that is what they obtained geometrically and then they multiplied this with the average energy associated with these standing waves. If I may complete this calculation the expression that Rayleigh genes obtained was 8 pi nu square d nu upon c cube times k t. So this first term here represents the total number of standing wave patterns obtained in a given frequency range within a cavity and the second term here essentially comes from classical kinetic theory or more specifically the law of equipartition of energy. The law of equipartition of energy says that if there is some system in thermal equilibrium with its surroundings then the average energy associated with that system uh, is half kT for per degree of freedom but because we are dealing with harmonic oscillators uh, and harmonic oscillators has an energy contribution from its potential energy as well as its kinetic energy the average energy comes out to be kT. Now why harmonic oscillators where well, you see the radiation which is the black body radiation coming out from the cavity walls comes from the harmonic oscillators in the cavity walls. What are these harmonic oscillators? These are charged particles, electrons let's suppose. So there are electrons in the metallic walls and these electrons are oscillating or vibrating because of the temperature of the body and because they are oscillating they behave as harmonic oscillators and because they behave as harmonic oscillators these oscillators emit radiation which is essentially electromagnetic oscillations and the average energy of these electromagnetic oscillations or these standing waves 
is kt right so this comes from geometrical arguments this comes from the law of equipartition of energy essentially classical physics what max planck did was he tried to resolve the discrepancy between the experimental observations and the theoretical calculations by questioning this particular expression essentially max planck questioned the law of equipartition of energy or the average energy associated with standing waves or harmonic oscillators in a system in thermal equilibrium how did he do that before i go into the explanation let me tell you something from my own experience okay just so that we can get the right perspective you see when i uh, used to take lab in college and I used to give some kind of an experiment to my students, maybe during an examination, like let's suppose a Cato's pendulum, where you have to calculate the acceleration due to gravity using a compound pendulum like a Cato's pendulum. And then you have to obtain some very accurate result like 9.8 something meter per second square. Now in the examination, what usually happens, not all the time, <laughs> but sometimes is that uh, Sometimes because of some reason, the student is unable to get that answer, which is 9.8. And maybe he gets an answer which is far away from 9.8, maybe 6.5 or 12 point something. And he gets scared because he doesn't want to lose marks. He doesn't want to seem like uh, he doesn't know how to do it. Uh, he wants to score good marks. So what some very clever, cunning students they would do is, they would go back in their calculation when the teacher is not looking and they would try to manipulate the observations or the data or the calculations so as to come up with the right answer which is 9.8 meter per second square i mean that's kind of cheating right but <laughs> what i am trying to uh, explain to you is that they would go it in a backward direction instead of doing the calculation top down like doing it systematically and coming up with the right answer they would go backward they know the result so they would try to change something in the calculations to come up with the right result that they know should come unfortunately something similar happened here because what max planck did he did not come up with some new explanation of some physical phenomena based on some axiom or first principle what he tried to do was he attempted to come up with the experimental observations. He wanted to modify the calculations that Rayleigh and Jeans did and he wanted to modify it in such a manner so that we will end up getting the experimental results. You see what I'm saying? So he did not provide some kind of a postulate regarding this is how nature behaves, no. We know what the experimental observations are. The problem that physics community was facing was they were unable to explain the experimental observation based on the classical understanding of physics. So what Max Planck did was, he tried to tweak the calculations somewhere here and there, more specifically in this particular term, to fit the results. And he would do so in a very successful manner and that would lead to some deeper understanding in physics. So let's come to that particular point. So what he observed very minutely is that, the Rayleigh genes prediction made sense for low frequencies because if you look at this expression, it, it is directly proportional to nu square. So for low frequencies, it fit the data, but it did not fit the data for larger values of frequency. And he questioned this particular quantity, this average quantity. What is this average quantity? This is the energy average. What did Planck propose? Planck proposed that the average energy for the standing waves of the black body radiation cavity should be equal to kT for low frequencies. That means for frequency tending to zero because this is giving us a good fit with the experimental data. The experimental data has a good fit with the theoretical calculations for low frequencies. So this should be kT for low frequencies or frequency tending to zero. But at some larger values of frequency, the theoretical prediction blows out. So this expression blows out to infinity. And to prevent that, he said that somehow the average energy of the standing waves in the cavity in 
instead of being equal to kt must go to zero as frequency tends to infinity. This is what he tried to impose on the calculations that the average energy must go to kt for low frequencies but there must be some cutoff beyond which for greater frequencies the average energy must go to zero to prevent this kind of a deviation from happening. And how did he do that? How did he accomplish this particular uh, condition? Because these are the two important conditions that he wanted to impose. To understand his uh, reasoning, first we must look at what is known as the Boltzmann distribution. So we have the Boltzmann distribution. The Boltzmann distribution is a probability distribution that gives us an idea about the state or the probability of finding a system in a given state as a function of the state's energy and temperature. Now why is Boltzmann distribution important is because it is from the Boltzmann distribution that we end up coming with the average energy associated with some kind of a standing wave. To understand that, let's first look at the Boltzmann distribution. Let me first draw it here on the side. All right, before we understand this graph, uh, let me give you a simple example. Imagine that there is a container in which there are a large number of gas molecules and these gas molecules are traveling at different uh, speeds, right? All the gas molecules can interact with each other, exchange energy with each other and the whole system is in thermal equilibrium at some given constant temperature. Now it is very much obvious that at any given point in time, not all the gas molecules will have the same energy. They will not have the same kinetic energy. Some of the molecules may be traveling at very high speeds. They will have great, greater kinetic energy. Some of the molecules may be at rest, may be motionless, may be traveling at very slow speeds. So there is a distribution of the speeds and therefore the energies of the gas molecules for a given system like this. If we look at the energy associated with these gas molecules in a particular direction, because we can have a 3D, 2D or even 1D system. In 3D, the gas molecules will have uh, velocities in three different directions. In 2D, it will have in two different directions. So let us just consider for one direction. If we look at the velocities of these gas molecules along one particular direction, then with increasing energy or with increasing velocity, the probability decreases exponentially. That means, Let's come back to this particular graph. The highest probability is associated with the gas molecules having zero energy and with increasing energy, the probability uh, decreases in an exponential fashion. The mathematical expression for this kind of a Boltzmann distribution is given by the probability associated with finding uh, one of these particles having energy E is essentially given by E to the power minus, here I'm writing epsilon to represent the energy epsilon upon kt whole divided upon kt. t here is the temperature, k is a Boltzmann constant, e is exponential and epsilon is the energy of the particle. Now based on this uh, understanding from uh, classical thermodynamics, if we want to calculate the average energy associated with all those gas molecules in one given direction, then the average energy essentially comes out to be the average of energy is essentially equal to the integration of E, P, E, D, E between zero and infinity and integration of P, E, D, E between zero and infinity. Now this should not be a very complicated uh, expression because for example, let me give you an example. If let's suppose that I take a test in the class and I have let's suppose 10 students, they all get different marks. Let's suppose uh, one student gets uh, zero marks out of 100, all right? And let's suppose uh, five students get 100 marks or 50 marks out of 100. And let's suppose four students get uh, 100 marks out of 100. So total number of students is 10. If I divide the summation by 10, this will give me the average marks of the class. One student gets 0 out of 100, 5 students get 50 out of 100, 4 students get 100 out of 100. So 10 students, the average comes out to be, I think, somewhere around 65 marks. So this is how you calculate average in any situation. The only difference is that here I have discrete values 
discrete numbers that the students are getting. This is a continuous distribution. Therefore, we have an integration. All right. So if I want to calculate the average of the energy of all the gas molecules, that will simply integrate this particular probability distribution in this particular manner to get the answer. To do that, let me draw another graph for the numerator. You see the denominator essentially is the area under the graph for this particular graph. But for the numerator, I need to multiply the probability associated with energy E to the energy E itself. This will give me a different looking graph. Let me draw that first. So this is the graph associated with E times PE in the Y axis versus E. All right, because there are certain number of particles that have zero energy. So when you multiply zero energy with whatever probability is, it ultimately comes out to be zero. So it starts with zero, but it rises up and then falls down back again. So essentially to find the average energy, what do you do is you need to find integrate the numerator, which is essentially the area under this curve divided by the integration of the denominator, which is the area under this curve. And essentially this comes out to be half KT for let's suppose a problem like the gas molecules that I was discussing, which is the law of equipartition of energy that for a system in thermal equilibrium, the average energy associated with each degree of freedom is half kT. That is a well-known statement in uh, classical uh, statistical mechanics. But we are not really dealing with gas molecules, right? We are dealing with black body radiation cavity. And inside the cavity, we have standing waves which are arising from harmonic oscillators. And harmonic oscillators, as I mentioned earlier, uh, have energy contributions from two different terms. So let me specify first that half KBT is the average energy associated with uh, one degree of freedom or any particle having one dimensional motion. In that case, we have uh, the average energy comes out to be half KT. But if we look at the total amount of energy for a free particle moving in three dimensional space, that would come out to be around half plus half plus half, three by two kT, right? And for the very unique case of harmonic oscillators, we are dealing with harmonic oscillators because the standing waves are essentially the result of the harmonic oscillators, which are the charged particles present in the walls of the cavity. For harmonic oscillators, the average energy comes out to be one contribution comes from uh, the potential energy term and another contribution comes from the kinetic energy term. So this is equal to KT. So for harmonic oscillators or standing waves inside the black body cavity, the average energy according to classical statistical mechanics uh, essentially is KT. This is why Rayleigh genes use a very known standard understanding of average energies of this kind of a system in thermal equilibrium in his expression, right? But Planck, Max Planck wants to avoid this. He wants to come up with this particular condition where the average energy for low frequencies will be this much, but the average energy for high frequencies will be zero. And how does he do that? How does he uh, change the calculations uh, to come up with this particular condition. You see, the genius of Max Planck is that instead of taking a distribution which is continuous, he took a distribution which is discrete. Let me explain. You see, at the end of the day, the black body radiation energy is coming from the light that is being emitted by the black body walls. The black body walls contain charged particles, which are the oscillators. And these oscillators are oscillating and they are emitting standing waves or electromagnetic radiation, which forms standing waves in the cavity, right? In classical mechanics, there is no restriction as to the energy of a standing wave. For example, if there is a standing wave between two walls, it might have a restriction on wavelength, but there is no restriction on energy because the energy depends upon the amplitude of the wave. The amplitude could be anything. For example, if I take another example like a spring mass system or a pendulum, 
there is no restriction as to what value of energy that spring mass system or the pendulum can take because with incremental increase in the amplitude of the pendulum it will start oscillating with greater energy or incremental increase in the amplitude of the spring mass system it will start oscillating with greater energy so energy distribution is continuous in classical systems like spring mass systems pendulums and even oscillators so therefore in the black body cavity these standing waves also have no restriction whatsoever on the energy associated with a given wavelength or frequency. What Max Planck assumed is that if it was possible that for some reason the energy instead of being a continuous distribution was a discrete distribution, would that satisfy the condition that we are interested in here? To understand that, let us look at a couple of graphs that I've made for you. Here is uh, distribution which is continuous just like what I drew some moments back in the blackboard in this continuous distribution the particle can have any energy available in the x-axis in the x-axis any possible value of energy is possible theoretically speaking in the system if I calculate the average energy it comes out to be what we have calculated here now what if we made the system uh, discrete so now we have a discrete system. In the discrete system, the particle cannot have any value of energy in the x-axis. It can only have certain values of energy. So let's suppose initially it can have a value of zero, then del epsilon, then twice del epsilon, then thrice del epsilon and on and on. So what Planck did was he assumed that these discrete values of energies, just for the sake of argument, are uniformly distributed. And these discrete values of energies, the particles can have energies of zero, it can have some value of energy of del epsilon, it can have twice del epsilon, thrice del epsilon, four times del epsilon, and on and on. So he took a very uniform distribution of the possible energy. So if the particle has some value of energy zero, then of course it has zero energy. For del epsilon, in the graph, you can see that there is a rectangle, right, with width of del epsilon and height associated with p times e and then for twice del epsilon again at a location of twice del epsilon in the x-axis and height of e times p and on and on. So you end up getting a distribution something like this which approximates the continuous distribution that we had. Now what if we tweak these values of del e? You see what del e is? Del e is just the spacing between the allowed energy values. All right, this particle can have definite allowed energy values and the spacing between them is del E. So what happens if we tweak the spacing between these values? Okay, so if we take a larger amount of spacing between the allowed values of energy that the particle in the system can have or the standing wave in the black body radiation cavity can have, then the distribution looks something like this. Let's take something more. We take greater amount of spacing, looks something like this. Even greater amount of spacing looks something like this. Now something very interesting happens when we go from the first graph with smaller amounts of spacing to the last graph of larger amounts of spacing. You have to understand that these are the allowed values of energy for the standing wave. So del E simply represents the spacing between the allowed values of energy, right? What happens is that if we calculate the average energy for the spacing being too small or the spacing being too large, it satisfies this particular condition. You see, even without doing any kind of a mathematical calculation, we can see it from the graph. Let's look at the graph once again. For a continuous distribution, the average energy lies at kT, okay? The average energy is equal to kT. For a discrete distribution where the spacing is very, very small, in that situation, the average energy may not be exactly at kT, but maybe somewhere near kT. Now, if we go to the next graph, here the spacing has increased slightly. And now the average energy is much less than kT. Because you see, the lowest energy possible is zero. The average energy is ultimately the area under the graph because so much amount of the graph is vacant Therefore, the average value of energy decreases. Now let's go on to the next one. 
where the spacing is actually almost equal to the value of kt. In this situation, the average energy decreases further because the average energy is essentially a representation of the area of these rectangles, right? The sum of all the areas of the rectangles. It has decreased. So therefore, the average energy has decreased much compared to kt. And ultimately, if we go to the next graph where the spacing is much, much large compared to the value of kt, in this situation, the average energy tends to zero. You see what is happening in all these graphs. As we take a discrete distribution, as we go from spacing being very small to spacing being very large. Spacing means the oscillators or the standing waves can have some discrete values of energy. The spacing between these allowed values. So if the spacing is very, very less, in that situation, the average energy or the area associated with all the rectangles is somewhere near kT. But if we increase the spacing significantly, a point comes that for larger values of del epsilon, the average energy comes out to be zero, thereby achieving the condition that Max Planck originally imposed on this particular experiment. Have you followed what I just mentioned? Not only Max Planck assumed that the amount of energy associated with the standing waves, which are being emitted by the oscillators in a black body cavity, has a discrete distribution. By looking at the spacing of these allowed energy values for small epsilon, so this is for a small epsilon, average energy is equal to kT, and for large epsilon, average energy is equal to zero, which is what we were interested in initially. Initially, we wanted to show that the average energy should be equal to kT for low values of frequency and the average energy should be equal to zero for high values of frequency. But according to Max Planck's uh, uh, calculations, for low values of epsilon, which is basically the spacing between different allowed energies, we get this result and for high values of spacing between allowed energies, we get this value. So this means that del E must have some relationship with frequency, right? For small values of frequency, we get the same result which we get for small values of epsilon and for large values of frequency, we get the same result as we get for large values of epsilon. So Planck considered that epsilon, del epsilon, which is essentially the spacing between the allowed energies of the standing waves must have some relationship with frequency and he assumed the most simplest relationship which is a linear relationship. So let us discuss that but let me rub all of this first. All right, so Planck assumed that the energy that is emitted by the black body walls uh, in the form of standing waves is happening in a discrete fashion of uh, zero del epsilon. Okay, so I'm using E and epsilon, uh, both of them for the same symbol, okay. Uh, two del epsilon, three del epsilon, and on and on. And I showed you just now that the average energy for the standing waves is almost equal to kT when this del epsilon, which is essentially the spacing between allowed energies, is small, okay, is small, is tending to, let's suppose, uh, zero, and the average energy is equal to zero when this del epsilon is large. Experimentally speaking, this is associated with small frequency and this is associated with large frequency. So what Planck proposed was that this epsilon, del epsilon, is a function of frequency and he assumed the most simplest relationships. He assumed that uh, del epsilon is directly proportional to frequency. 
let us go along with this okay let us go along with these calculations and see what we get ultimately so if this is the proportionality relationship then del epsilon is equal to there is some proportionality constant here let us suppose that proportionality constant is h by the way this h is going to be called as a Planck's constant later on multiplied by the frequency this is the Planck's postulate the postulate that the energy associated with the standing waves being emitted by the black body cavity walls is happening in a discrete values where the discrete values are equally spaced or uniformly spaced and that spacing is basically equal to h nu how does that affect the rest of the calculations let me first demonstrate that to you and then we will talk about all the <laughs> physics and everything associated with this okay so ultimately we are interested in figuring out the average energy right so if we are interested in figuring out the average energy associated with the standing waves the average energy i already showed you has a formula where there's an integration of e times p e right but now we cannot use integration because we are not really dealing with continuous distribution of energies anymore we are dealing with a discrete distribution of energy so for discrete distribution of energy we are interested in a summation so we will get a summation of e times p e upon summation over p e where summation is n is equal to uh, 0 to infinity what is n here i'm just going to come to that in a moment n is equal to 0 to infinity i'm going to come to n in a moment but what is p here p here is the boltzmann distribution the probability distribution which says that it is much more likely to find a standing wave having lower energy compared to higher energy there is an exponential decrease uh, if you look at the probability of finding a standing wave having certain kind of energy and that is given by p e is equal to e to the power minus epsilon upon kt upon kt this is the boltzmann uh, distribution by the way planck did not really change the boltzmann distribution he did not make any other changes the only assumption max planck made was that the radiation emitted by the cavity walls was happening not in a continuous fashion but in a discrete fashion where the energies were equally spaced by something that is directly proportional to frequency that was the only assumption Planck made and that would change the whole calculations okay so if I plug this everything here together what should we get first of all what is e okay e or epsilon so e can take the values of zero right del e del e is equal to how much h nu and 2 del e so 2 h nu 3 del e so 3 h nu 4 h nu 5 h nu and on and on okay so e is essentially equal to n h nu where n is an integer that can take the values of 0 1 2 3 and on and on all right so e is equal to n h nu so i'm going to substitute n h nu here in this expression and we will get something that looks like this so let us make a very simple assumption that uh, n h nu upon kt is equal to alpha if i make that assumption that n no not n but rather h nu h nu upon kt is equal to alpha then this summation simplifies to sum over n is equal to 0 to infinity n alpha e to the power minus n alpha divided by sum over n is equal to 0 to infinity e to the power minus n alpha and here you'll have kt come out of this expression so this will be multiplied in the numerator all right so now to uh, solve this let us evaluate a particular expression okay so i've written an expression here minus alpha d upon d alpha log summation of e to the power minus n alpha if you look at this particular expression then d upon d alpha of log something this uh, can be written as minus alpha 
d upon d alpha of sum over e to the power minus n alpha n is equal to 0 to infinity uh, upon sum over n is equal to 0 to infinity e to the power minus n alpha. Now, if I take the derivative inside the summation d upon d alpha of e to the power minus n alpha, this is going to take the form of in the numerator, I will have minus minus, so it will get cancelled out and then I will have n alpha and then here you will have summation n is equal to 0 to infinity e to the power minus n alpha and in the bottom you will have summation, no the n alpha should come uh, inside the summation right because the summation is over n, so the n alpha should come inside the summation. Okay, let me rub this whole thing and uh, so in the numerator I should get summation n is equal to 0 to infinity n alpha e to the power minus n alpha and in the denominator you have n is equal to 0 to infinity e to the power minus n alpha. This expression is exactly the same as this expression or rather except for kt right. So therefore I can uh, substitute this uh, here so if I say this is point number 1 and I say point number 2, so using uh, point number 2 in point number 1, we get that the average energy comes out to be this expression times kt, so I can say that this is equal to minus alpha kt d by d alpha of ln sum over n is equal to 0 to infinity e to the power minus n alpha. Now alpha is equal to this particular quantity. All right. Now let us look at this particular summation. Okay. So if I am interested in looking at e to the power minus n alpha summation n is equal to 0 to infinity, what are the terms that we get? For n is equal to 0, I get 1. Right. And then I get for n is equal to 1 e to the power minus alpha. For n is equal to 2, e to the power minus 2 alpha. For n is equal to 3, e to the power minus 3 alpha and all these other terms in finite series I get. Now if I assume that e to the power minus alpha is let's suppose uh, uh, x, <laughs> okay, <laughs> again another assumption that e to the power minus uh, alpha is equal to x. In that situation this becomes 1 plus uh, x plus x square plus x cube and on and on. So what is this 1 plus x plus x square plus x cube? I can say that this is equal to 1 minus x to the power minus 1. Binomial expansion, right? 1 minus x to the power minus 1 is 1 ma plus x plus x square plus x cube and on and on. So therefore this essentially comes out to be 1 minus x is equal to 1 minus e to the power minus alpha to the power minus 1 is the average, no, this particular summation. So if I plug in the summation into this particular equation, so again I'll get some more calculations. So let me first rub this portion, okay? And then we'll have some more space. All right, so the average energy therefore becomes is equal to minus alpha k t. Now what was alpha? Alpha I had already mentioned that uh, alpha was equal to h nu upon kt, right? So alpha times kt would simply mean that I will have h nu remaining. So minus h nu will be here. Then you have d upon d alpha ln and the summation is actually equal to this much which is 1 minus e to the power minus alpha to the power minus 1. So log of something d by d alpha of this, how much will we get? We should get something like minus h nu and because this is log of something and d by d alpha, so I should get 1 upon uh, 1 minus e to the power minus alpha to the power minus 1. Now if I differentiate this term, it should be minus 1. 1 minus e to the power minus alpha to the power minus 1 minus 1 minus 2. Okay, and then further, if I differentiate d upon d alpha of 1 minus e to the minus alpha, I should get minus minus plus e to the power alpha or e to the power minus alpha. That's it. All right, so <laughs> let us combine everything. 
uh, it seems that the, the calculation is, is a bit lengthy it's okay let's combine this whole thing here okay so the average energy therefore comes out to be so minus minus gets cancelled you have h nu here and then 1 minus 0 minus alpha minus 1 gets cancelled with this you're left with uh, h nu upon 1 minus e to the power minus alpha here and then e to the power minus alpha here if you take this so h nu upon this becomes e to the power uh, alpha minus 1 right you take the, this term to the denominator e to the power alpha minus 1 so what is alpha alpha is h nu upon kt so therefore finally we end up getting the nature of the average energy expression here so this comes out to be average energy for the standing waves in a black body radiation is h nu upon e to the power h nu upon kt minus 1 this is the average energy calculated by Planck uh, based upon the assumption that the energy emitted by the cavity walls in the form of standing waves happen in discrete values and not in a continuous fashion so if this is the average energy we can calculate the energy density how did we calculate the energy density in the Rayleigh genes expression we multiplied the number of standing waves in a given frequency interval with the average energy right but now the average energy is this according to Planck uh, so therefore finally the energy density is equal to the number of standing wave uh, for a given frequency interval and that comes out to be 8 pi nu square upon c cube d nu multiplied by this average energy expression which is h nu upon e to the power h nu upon kt minus 1 this my dear friends ladies and gentlemen is the Planck's energy distribution for the black body radiation uh, graph if you look at this expression you will see that the graph does not have some direct new square proportionality because there is also this particular expression e to the power h nu upon kt minus 1 so if you make a slight comparison uh, let me again <laughs> rub some portion of the board uh, to give you a small comparison what happens for extremely uh, small values of frequency for frequency tending to 0 what does this become e to the power nu uh, h nu upon kt is approximately equal to so e to the power x can be written as a series sum 1 plus e to the power x and on and on so if you just sorry 1 plus x plus on and on so if you just write the first two terms for small values of frequency because for higher values those other terms will not survive for extremely small values of frequency we should get something like 1 plus h nu upon kt the other terms will vanish for small values of uh, frequency so this therefore comes out to be uh, 1 minus or rather e to the power h nu upon kt is approximately equal to h nu upon kt so if i take h nu upon kt and i substitute here h nu h nu will get cancelled the only thing remaining here will be kt so this gives us the Rayleigh genes expression you see that for small values of frequency h nu upon kt if i take this to the denominator h nu h nu will get cancelled and in the numerator you will have kt left so here you will have kt so that is the Rayleigh genes expression which is true for lower values of frequency and for higher values of frequency for frequency tending to let's suppose infinity in that kind of a situation this whole thing will tend to infinity right so h nu upon kt would tend to infinity so e to the power h nu upon kt would tend to infinity so denominator tends to infinity so the energy would tend to zero which is what happens with increasing frequency the energy distribution goes to zero low frequencies fits the data high frequencies fits the data in fact if we plot this expression in some kind of a graph we actually get
exactly the experimental distribution for black body radiation spectrum. The Planck's energy distribution correctly predicted the black body experimental observations and thereby avoided the ultraviolet catastrophe. This was the genius of Max Planck that he realized where the problem was in the classical calculations to explain the black body radiation spectrum and he realized that the problem was with the calculation of the average energy of the standing waves. The average energy of the standing waves was calculated using equipartition theorem which predicted the average energy comes out to be half kT for uh, uh, one degree of freedom and for harmonic oscillators kT. But in classical systems, the uh, energy distribution is continuous. That means any kind of a harmonic oscillator like a pendulum or a spring mass system can absorb or emit energy in a continuous fashion. There is no range or values which restrict how much energy it can emit or absorb. But Planck made the assumption that instead of a continuous emission of energy, energy is emitted in discrete values only. So he went from a continuous manner of energy emission by the cavity walls to a discrete manner of energy emission by the cavity walls and that continuous to discrete happens so the energy happens in amounts of n h nu so energy for a given frequency is emitted as zero h nu 2 h nu 3 h nu 4 h nu and when he did that he was successfully able to explain the experimental observations of black body radiation spectrum now we have to keep in mind that planck did not really realize how fundamental an equation he had discovered in quantum mechanics this postulate is probably one of the very famous equations out there <laughs> simple and a very famous equation the planck's postulate he did not realize at that point in time that he had discovered something very deeply fundamental about physics in a microscopic levels. He thought that he was just explaining the black body radiation spectrum. He thought that he was just trying to circumvent the classical explanation and trying to come up with a new perspective of explaining the black body radiation spectrum. He thought that this discrete emission of energy by the oscillators on the black body uh, cavity wall is something that is very unique to the black body experiment only. He did not realize that this is something that is very fundamental. It took another genius to realize the importance of this equation. We will see uh, in a couple of lectures how Albert Einstein realized that this equation is not necessarily true just for the black body radiation spectrum but this is universally true. And he's going to use this equation later on in the explanation of photoelectric effect. Thereby cementing the importance of this particular idea that standing waves emitted or the electromagnetic radiation emitted by walls happen not in a continuous fashion but in discrete values. Which tells us something fundamental about the nature of the oscillators in the first place. <laughs> Alright, this was a very lengthy video. We will discuss all of these things in a summary video in my coming lecture. In my coming lecture, we'll discuss everything from the starting lecture of Black Body Radiation Part 1 to Black Body Radiation Part 3. We'll discuss the conclusions and how these ideas can be taken forward in other uh, videos. That is all for today. I'm Divya Das. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.